Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hello, and thank you for watching. For the past few weeks, Central Square has played host to public property as that we have a tragedy of the commons issue. Saying happy holidays, team. Volunteer interactions where individuals are free to act so long as they don't initiate force. This morning, we gather in Lampert, Sergeant Tom Ball. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Allie Havens. We have a quick update on a topic covered last week. The Bearcat is back on the table for public discussion. City Councilor Terry Clark, the one dissenting vote on whether the City Council should accept the grant, has written, a new, has written Mayor Kendall Lane to ask for a public hearing at the committee level. On February 2nd, the full City Council is set to talk about the issue, and on February 9th, the public will be allowed to co comment on the issue at a Finance Committee meeting. The rest of this episode is devoted to one topic, the war on drugs. With us tonight is Bob Constantine, who has had a personal experience with the drug war. Welcome to the show, Bob. Can, Thanks, you, tell the, can you tell the viewers a little about your situation? Sure. Uh, my name is Bob Constantine. I've lived in New Hampshire most of my 52 years, and uh, I was arrested in 2009 in September. Um, there was a long legal process, and uh, it uh, it strengthened my resolve to uh, become a, more of an activist and do these things uh, uh, to end this uh, war on drugs. So um, you feel like your um, involvement in activism sort of started afterwards? Did you consider yourself an activist before you were Well, arrested? I certainly was an activist before, um, but rather than this uh, putting me in a position uh, where I was uh, having to explain and, and say I'm sorry, it, it strengthened my resolve. Um, and I, I think that uh, when it lands squarely on your shoulders, that's a personal decision that everybody has to make. But for me, um, I'm very interested in having peaceful people own themselves, and I think that's the right thing to do. So you were arrested. What were you charged with? I was charged with a felony in New Hampshire, um, manufacturing a controlled drug, marijuana. Um, and again, the, the legal process went on for just about a year and a half, two years, and uh, Eventually, it came down to a misdemeanor possession. Um, I had a trial. I argued my own case at the end. I had a lawyer or two in, in the beginning and so forth. Um, so that must have been a long, you said two years, one to two years? Yeah, it, uh, from September of 2009 when I was first arrested until April of 2011. Um, we had several uh, fault starts. You know, we had trial dates, and for various reasons, um, things were... Um, you know, trials got bumped and little matters and so forth. So. so I've seen some of the videos of your case and it seems like you had a lot of support, so that's really awesome. I did have a lot of support and I'm very appreciative of that and I think that's what people need to do is um, a lot of times they don't really want you to speak out and they don't want others to support you. Um, they'd rather sweep these things under the rug and I think it's time that people come out and discuss this in an open and rational way. Indeed. We have a video compilation of Patricia Smith and what happened to her. Can you tell us how you know about Patricia? I sure can. Um, that fall, um, I was doing an awful lot of research at the fall of 2009, and I think I came upon a newspaper clip that uh, said a woman in Grafton County in her late 50s, I'm in my early 50s, someone more or less a contemporary had been arrested. And um, it just sort of stuck with me. I thought, well, geez, that, that doesn't sound really this isn't some 20-year-old kid. So then when I was at the Grafton County uh, Superior Court for one of the hearings, we had all kinds of hearings on different things, um, I saw her and it dawned on me, I bet that's who, that's this Patricia Smith. So I went over, this is in August, I believe, and I went over and introduced myself. And it was a really hard thing because um, for her, um, I think that she was there with her attorney. She was probably at her final pretrial hearing or something like that. And I could tell that she was scared and didn't really, you know, want any of this happening in her life. So I let her know. I said, you know, there are people out there who support you. And I think that really, we made it kind of a connection there. And we became friends after that. And I started to uh, follow her case and advocate for her. That's excellent. Um, we have a, uh, we'll be starting a video at a time pausing to discuss the content with Bob. Please watch. Patricia Smith, then my trial starts today. What are you on trial for? Growing marijuana. Okay. I just think the law should be on trial, not me. 
This case is about manufacturing marijuana. On the 20th of November, which is a Friday morning, around 8, 8.15 in the morning, Detective James, Sergeant Prince, and some other colleagues from the Sheriff's Department descended upon the defendant's house. There was a secret room down in the basement where these cloning machines are located. The state will be able to prove that Patricia Smith was growing marijuana in her house. Patricia Smith is 56 years old. She has absolutely no prior record whatsoever. She is a registered nurse. She was growing marijuana for her own use and for the use of her 24-year-old daughter, who, by the way, now lives in Massachusetts, where it's decriminalized, where she can use it for her bipolar condition. She's got absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Patricia Smith is a drug dealer, right? No. They control the drug. How say who's the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Juror number one, how say who's the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Juror number two. Guilty. Juror number three. Guilty. Juror number four. Guilty. I'm Rita Richards. I'm Patricia's mother. You have a letter that you'd like to read? Yes. This is all has been a horrible nightmare. There appears to be no awake from. Patricia did break the law, but she didn't commit commit a huge crime. I was a correctional officer for 15 years. I've been through some of the justice system, but this is one that holds no consideration for anyone. What was the judge's response to these letters? I don't even know whether he read them. I didn't bring up a criminal. I brought up a good, good person. Patricia's defense was no defense save for the fact that she was not harming any others and minding her own business. What can you tell us about the trial the video did not share? Well, during that trial, one thing that I noticed is the jury seemed almost mechanical in a sense that um, there was like there was this invisible line between them, that this, the judge and the prosecutor. I, there weren't very many people that attended her trial, which I felt bad for, and a lot of people supported me. Um, but at her trial, I tried to make eye contact with, her, with the jurors, and it's like they didn't want to look at me, almost like they were ashamed of what they were doing, but they felt like they had to do it. Hmm. It, it kind of reminds me of those experiments they've conducted where uh, people tend to side with the authority figure, and in this sense, it's the judge. And yeah, I, I've forgotten the name of that, but in France, they did that where they'd have to press a button and it would, uh, an electrical shock I think shock it's Milgram. Somebody. Yeah, the Milgram experiment, exactly. Um, it made me feel that these people um, had, uh, fallen into this uh, trap of just doing our job mm -hmm. and, and really not think about the morality of the situation or what they were doing. And also, um, they had been made aware that the jury could nullify or exercise their conscience. And I was very hopeful when Attorney Sisti, that was essentially the defense, um, when he gave his closing argument, I was very hopeful that uh, one of the jurors would have their conscience speak to them and they'd do something, but they didn't. Blind obedience to authority is a very dangerous thing. Yes, it is. Let's continue with the video. I absolutely feel like I've been punished since the day that I have been arrested. Yes, I was arrested on in November 20th, 2009, and ever since then, I felt like, you know, this pending doom hanging over my head. I also, I have no criminal record. I feel like I've been a community servant for the last 30 years. I've been a nurse. I've worked in obstetrics. I've worked in intensive care units, surgical intensive care units. I know that I've helped people. There was no victim in my crime, you know. Um, There's nobody that you could pay back even if you wanted to. No, I it was, it was, it was, I just apologize to the state of New Hampshire. I apologize to every person in New Hampshire because I grew some marijuana and I'm very sorry I hurt you. But I, I just want to say, like, it's my opinion, of course, but I think that law should be reflect reality. For example, we have a law that say, or you cannot drink until you're 21. I would like to know how many people actually wait till they're 21 years old to have a drink. Laws obviously need to change over time. In the 1920s, it was illegal for a nurse or a doctor to give a woman information about birth control. In the 1960s, it was illegal to marry someone of a different race. We have all become complacent in our society. I'm as guilty of that as anyone else. We have not been encouraged to, to no. speak up and to, I know part of it is people feel like even if they do speak up, it won't make any difference. You know, you're right, you're congressman, you're right, you're, 
your representative, your senator, your governor, a lot of people feel like it won't make any difference. A lot of people don't even vote. It's been around for thousands of years. It's not going to go away. People are not going to stop smoking marijuana, ingesting marijuana. It's a beneficial drug. I've heard many doctors tell patients marijuana would probably be helpful for this. But of course, be careful and don't tell anyone I told you that. <laughs> um, part of why marijuana is not being legalized is the government does not want to admit the positive uses of marijuana, and the pharmaceutical companies don't want to admit about the um, beneficial properties of marijuana, not only marijuana, but any natural remedy. You don't always have to take a pill for every illness that you have that they want you to. They want us to think that we do have to. You know, there's advertisements constantly on television for pharmaceutical drugs. Most studies that have been done by the government have actually shown that marijuana is a beneficial drug. Even way back when Nixon did these studies, and those studies have been buried. And government studies have also shown that there is more harm being done by prosecuting people than by the use of the plant. And that, from my personal experience, I can say is absolutely true. My mom does have arthritis, and she actually was joking with me the other day about how People have said to her, you should try some marijuana to relieve some of your joint discomfort. And, and uh, I said, yeah, and, uh, and then maybe you might actually feel a little cheerful. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you know and uh, she, she's devastated. Everyone, all of my family, friends, um, they really just devastated too by what's happening. But they're supportive and they're behind me and they think, that this is so wrong. Um, aside from the beneficial aspects of medical marijuana, marijuana increases the person's imagination, their creativity, their insight, their free thinking. It promotes social values. It promotes people to think about what is good for the common good for all people. And these thoughts are unwelcome in our government today. Police have become more like a military, waging war on their own people. Hard-working, decent people. Are they our public servants? Are they our public enemies? Because I really feel like they're our public enemy. The benefits of marijuana come from a nurse who has spent her life helping to heal people. Bob, is there any pill that has such benefits associated with it? Uh, none that I'm aware of, but I, I think when you look at the substance itself, clearly uh, cannabis is less harmful than what the state sells. Alcohol, you can buy alcohol, they sold $534 million worth of it. There's a U.S. Surgeon General report out there that declares alcohol as the second leading cause of death to tobacco. If you go all the way down to the bottom through all of these other things, pharmaceuticals and so forth, cannabis is at the bottom zero. Right. So it's a very hypocritical situation. We can discuss the substance, but at the core of it for me is the substance is kind of irrelevant. I think it's more of a liberty issue and who owns your body, but they lose on both sides as far as I'm concerned. You know, I do get upset about this. It's an upsetting thing. It's probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And yet the um, probation, before they sentence you, you have to go talk to a probation officer and he writes down everything you says and forms his opinion about what your sentence should be. He actually said in there that I was crying to manipulate him. And I'm sorry, I'm crying because this is upsetting and unfair, cruel, terrible thing to do to someone. They treat you like a criminal from the second you're arrested, whether you've with, you know, no matter what, you are a criminal in their eyes, and they are the ones that are criminals. They're destroying people's lives over something that should be legal. They have no right to do this. They're horrible, horrible. I don't know how they can do their job. I don't know how they can sleep at night doing this. I believe that law enforcement, the state, they, they 
they actually, you know, financially rape a person like me, and that is what they've done. And um, if they could just open their minds and legalize marijuana and, you know, make us get a card or whatever, I mean, that shouldn't even be, that. we should be beyond that and just legalize it. But of course they wouldn't make any money if they just legalized it. And who benefits? Um, I strongly believe that pharmaceutical companies are against the legalization of marijuana because marijuana could be used for a lot of a lot of things that pharmaceutical drugs are used for. And it's a lot less harmful to a person to use marijuana than to use... Uh, that's why I chose it. Uh, I didn't want to um, become addicted to a pharmaceutical narcotic or some drug for pain. And I know for a fact that marijuana is not addicting because I stopped smoking it the day after I was arrested and I had no side effects whatsoever. When the U.S. Marshal came to my house, um, because they come to your house when the government is putting your house in forfeiture, uh, he was extremely apologetic. Um, you know, he felt terrible. We could not wait to retire. How can anyone have a job where you're hurting people and devastating them and harming them and continue to do and, it? And continue to do it, exactly. Do you know that police can legally lie to you when they arrest you? They can say, well, we have witnesses that say you did this or say you did that to get you to say what they want you to say. And that's illegal for them to lie to you. Um, and the, like I said, the police detective said to me several times, if you cooperate, if you tell us the truth, everything will go much better for you. During my trial, he actually denied saying that. I think laws should be in effect to promote our freedoms. What's next for Nurse Patricia? I think what's next for Nurse Patricia, unfortunately, is she's probably going to be going to state prison. We don't know when. Um, I know that her attorney, I spoke to Patricia today, her attorney has put in a motion for reconsideration with the Supreme Court on the recent uh, appeal. Um, if that doesn't go through, uh, there's some talk about a, a federal appeal to the next level beyond the state of New Hampshire, but unfortunately, I think uh, her sentence will begin sometime relatively soon, and that's two to four years in the state prison. Is there anything that anyone watching or anyone here should do if they want to support her? Yeah, I think she'd certainly appreciate some support, um, you know, writing to her, but also on the outside, you know, I, I hate to be fatalistic about her situation, but I think people need to express what an outrage this is. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to speak up. We have another compelling video from a different perspective. Cheshire County Department of Corrections Superintendent Rick Ben Winkler is one of the only active duty law enforcement officers to be a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He recently stopped by the Capitol to give some testimony in favor of a bill that would legalize marijuana for adults. House Bill 1705 quote, allowing purchase and use of marijuana for adults, regulating the purchase and use of marijuana, and imposing taxes on the wholesale and retail sale of marijuana, unquote. Here's some video of the superintendent Rick Van Winkler's testimony before the Criminal Justice Committee just last week. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Committee. My name is Richard Ben Wickler. I'm a long life resident of New Hampshire and have served the last 24 years in law enforcement and continue to do so as the superintendent of the Cheshire County Department of Corrections. I do not represent Cheshire County here today. I've taken a vacation day to be here in order to testify as a member of law enforcement against prohibition. LEAP is a nonprofit organization consisting of law enforcement officers, judges, corrections professionals, and others who oppose the current war on drugs policy. House Bill 1705 is smart and responsible legislation, and I speak in favor of this bill. To begin my testimony, I want it to be very clear that I do not advocate the use of alcohol, tobacco, 
marijuana, or any non-prescribed drug. This discussion and this bill is about our drug policy and the effects of that policy. And considering drug policy in our state and in our nation, we have to ask ourselves the following questions. Is what we are doing effective toward creating a drug-free society? Because that's what the state admission of the current drug war is. Has crime been reduced because of our current policies? Are we safer as a community because of our current policies? Are the costs of incarceration and the surveillance justified? Criminal justice policy should be about promoting public safety, and it should be about preventing crime. Our current policies do not achieve this. In my study of drug war policy, I utilized government-produced data that was funded by our tax dollars, and also reputable research from widely accepted sources to reach my conclusion. As for a policy that protects our citizens, consider that each year in the United States alone, tobacco kills 435,000 people. Poor diet and physical inactivity kill 365,000 people. The illicit use of illegal drugs kills 17,000 people, and the use of marijuana has not killed one single person. The Drug Enforcement Agency has indicated that 75% of the gang war violence is over illegal drug marketplace disputes. The violence associated with drug use in our country is not because of the substance, it's because of the prohibition of those substances. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country. We have 5% of the world's population and we have 25% of the world's inmates. We now have 2.7 million people behind bars. We have over 7 million people in our correctional system. Consider that 114 million Americans have admitted to using an illegal drug in their lifetime, and 34 million have admitted to using in the last 12 months. The majority of users, by far, is for the use of marijuana. Taking this into consideration, and assuming that we can arrest our way out of this, then we must increase our national jail bed space from 2.4 million jail beds to at least 35 million jail beds. Unfortunately, our current correctional system has become one we can no longer afford. Opponents of this bill will tell you, they'll bring up the issue of the gateway theory. There's no study or research ever produced that anyone can cite that will support this. In fact, all studies conducted reveal that the opposite is true. There is no connection. That excuse was first used before Congress in 1937, and it's fascinating that law enforcement officials will use this testimony to support current drug prohibition laws. Opponents of ending the drug war will testify that if marijuana is legalized, that it will be more readily available. The facts are that marijuana is readily available everywhere in the United States right now. It is so available that our children can buy it in unlimited supply in our schools, which is why pa passage of this legislation is so essential. School children report annually that obtaining illegal drugs is far easier than accessing alcohol or tobacco. Regulating where this substance is and who can access it it's currently what we do not have in our existing policies. This legislation seeks to correct that problem. Opponents of this legislation will tell you that the rate of use among minors will increase if marijuana is legalized. The <coughs> facts are overwhelming that everywhere in this country and around the world where prohibition is eased, the use of the substance goes down, especially with minors. Some law enforcement officers will suggest to you that if this legislation passes, more people will drive under the influence of it. This is preposterous because it assumes that laws dictate behavior. If laws did in fact dictate behavior, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. And of course, once again, there's no evidence to support that claim. Opponents of this bill will say, what kind of a message are we going to be sending to our children if we pass this bill? The current message that we send to our children is this. First, we know that marijuana is widely available to you and that there's a very good chance that you're going to be in its presence and pressured by peers to use it. We don't know who is selling it to you or your peers or what it might be tainted with. 
The sellers certainly don't care who you are, and we know that. We know that the unlimited supply of marijuana in America is not going to end. We know that the 6,000% markup on this widely used product funds terrorism. The current message to our children is that we've known these facts for 40 years and simply do not know or we do not care what to do about it. In the interest of time, I won't go on with the endless list of unsubstantiated reasons that opponents will give. I'll tell you that there is no evidence to support the claims that a lot of them will make. In summary, our country will spend this year approximately $88 billion and yet another attempt to create a drug-free society and it's going to So he's the superintendent and he knows what's going on with the drug war. Why doesn't everyone understand the issue? They have a mercenary self-interest not to understand the issue. A lot of people have jobs in the DEA, prosecutors, judges, police, all of that. About 114 million Americans out of 300 plus million people admit to using cannabis at one time or another in the last year. You can't put them all in jail. So I'd like to applaud Rick Van Wickler for his position. He's a member of LEAP, that's Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Um, I think uh, more police officers and uh, uh, prison wardens and so forth ought to look into that because I think he's making the right moral choice and he's also making the right uh, choice about the substance itself. I mean, his eyes are open. I think he's a smart man. Do you think that this is a, a good bill, like for it to be, I assume it would be regulated sort of like cigarettes or something? I'm not in favor of any type of regulation. I think that when you don't harm anyone that you should uh, make choices about your body. Um, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, as opposed to blocking people up, I think it's better than that. I would, I would definitely say so. Um, do, you, do you think that there will be a lot of support for this bill? I think this particular bill will probably um, not get all the way in, in passed. Um, I think that the decrim bill coming up uh, this Thursday, legislative office building, and there's also an, another bill um, to take uh, making, uh, cultivating marijuana out of uh, manufacturing. I think those bills have a better chance. Um. So, well, thank you for being on the show, Bob Constantine. Uh, I hope you will come back and update us about your case. And I'd like to do that, Allie. I'd like to talk more about this. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight. As always, you can contact Freekeen TV by sending an email to tv at freekeen.com. Freekeen TV is also looking for inter interested individuals to be part of the cast and crew. If you're interested, send us an email and put crew in the subject line. I'm Allie Havens, wishing you and yours only the best. Okay.